Hello, dear students. Uh, welcome to this uh, lecture number two uh, with the theme project planning and control, and especially schedule and resource management. Regarding uh, this uh, LO2, uh, the purpose is to help you to study uh, these uh, book sections uh, listed in this uh, picture and also uh, uh, the uh, corresponding uh, lecture videos, pre-recorded lecture videos. Also, uh, uh, the self-study lessons, uh, lesson exercises in uh, all of my courses, uh, learning environment are uh, the following, uh, which are listed in this picture. And also, uh, this uh, helps you to uh, prepare for uh, the project schedule and resource planning group assignment. Okay. Now, uh, what is the actual content of this lecture? Project planning and uh, project plan. Then golden principles for defining the project scope and project work content. Uh, activities. When we are talking about uh, uh, project work, so I use uh, the word activity synonymously to uh, work when we are talking about uh, scheduling. So activities, uh, forming the activity network and calculating the activity network to find out the schedule of uh, how to position uh, the activities in the time axis, in calendar, so to say. And then uh, we are talking about resources and uh, costs and also uh, the connection between uh, the uh, schedule and uh, costs. So activities consume resources and cost, and uh, that's why, uh, depending on how we position the activities uh, in the schedule, that affects also uh, how the costs are accumulated. Okay, uh, now in this picture, uh, we have this same uh, content list, uh, but uh, you can uh, find uh, there a little bit more detailed uh, subtitles or rubrics uh, under these uh, four uh, main uh, themes. Okay, um, now let's uh, dive in uh, to this content. First, project planning and project plan. Okay, uh, in your material, uh, you have a picture uh, about the project life cycle and also uh, the knowledge areas or management areas of a project. Uh, in this lecture, we are going to focus on this uh, blue colored uh, uh, items. So first of all, uh, the project startup and planning phases, uh, early phases of the project, and then scope management and schedule and resource management. And also, uh, as far as uh, integration management is concerned, I would say that uh, in the beginning of the project, uh, the project plan and uh, planning uh, is a rather important uh, uh, method uh, for uh, integration management and also uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the projects, project manager's tasks and uh, what is the project manager's role of integrating uh, uh, the project in the early phases. Okay, then the other, uh, what, let's say project management knowledge areas and, uh, and uh, uh, management areas are uh, listed here in this picture uh, and the lower part and uh, uh, they are relevant also in uh, as kind of a topics uh, in, in the actual project plan. Okay, but, but the blue areas are now, uh, now in our focus. 
Well, um, how the project plan uh, evolves or uh, comes into uh, being a project plan. So we can talk about different uh, uh, documents like a project description, uh, which might be kind of a, the early phase, uh, very generic uh, idea uh, of a project and w why it is done and what are the benefits and what, what is the purpose and uh, what, what kind of a, uh, choices we should uh, make when when thinking about uh, the forthcoming project. Project proposal can be uh, a more uh, kind of a detailed uh, uh, description also partly about how the project would be executed and that project proposal could be the basis for an investment decision or if we are supplying the project to a customer then uh, we could uh, think about the kind of a bid review uh, meeting and uh, to make a decision whether we should bid at all uh, or, or, or not and, and so on. And then when the project starts, then uh, in the very beginning uh, we are uh, making the project plan. And the project plan is a kind of a uh, um, document uh, for the actual project uh, organization, a kind of a mutual agreement or a kind of a, a Bible, if, if, if you like, uh, for the project uh, team uh, to understand how the project is done, that everyone understands it in the same way, what are the objectives, how we uh, run the project and the different uh, management areas yeah, in, in the project. Okay, now uh, the content, uh, table of contents of a project plan. So I wanted to emphasize uh, here with red color that this is a sample uh, content and uh, it can vary depending on the project. Uh, but uh, the big important elements uh, are uh, the following. First, uh, background and benefits. We should always describe why the project initially was uh, started. So what do we aim uh, to, to achieve with the project? What are the benefits? Uh, what is the actual early background of why the project was started and so on? Goal and objectives, of course, risks, and risk management, also opportunities, uh, which are included in this kind of a risk theme. Then project organization and responsibilities. How do we uh, organize the project? Is, for example, the, the customer part of the project organization, are the suppliers part of it? Or shall we talk about the, the suppliers or sub-project contractors uh, uh, in, in this uh, item number nine, procurement management, uh, is it, or is it part of this kind of organizing and organization? Uh, scope and scope management, not only uh, what is the project end product and uh, what are the specifications, but also how it is managed continue, continuously during the project uh, execution. For example, are we making uh, the specification more detailed uh, when we come closer to towards uh, the midst of the project or the end of the project. So shall we uh, kind of a, uh, detail the actual uh, project target uh, over time and, and how we do it. Shall we report uh, on a weekly basis, monthly basis uh, or so. Also, uh, uh, when it comes to reporting and communications, that is very important, uh, the item number 11. And uh, uh, what comes to uh, 12 complementary parts and appendices, so it's important to understand that details are important, but if there are a lot of detailed specifications and so on, so we can put them in appendices and try to keep the uh, actual project plan rather clear. Um, it also can be possible that we have a 
common project plan with the customer or common project plan with the suppliers. But then we must remember that not all information can be or normally is not shared with uh, external parties, like for example our profits or, uh, or, or cost data that all cannot necessarily be shared with uh, other partners. Of course, there can be this kind of an open book like uh, projects which, uh, uh, where we can op rather openly share uh, the things uh, among suppliers and, uh, and, uh, and customers. But, uh, but normally, uh, I would say that uh, these parties would have their own project plans uh, with such details that are not many times shared with others. Okay, when, when we are talking about uh, reporting and communications, so is it weekly meetings with the project team? Do we meet customer? Do we meet how, how often do we meet with the customer? Uh, how often do we uh, visit uh, the supplier's uh, uh, office or uh, workshops or, uh, or, or, or uh, some other places to uh, inspect and control and collaborate with the cost, uh, supplier. And, uh, and, and this all uh, is kind of a reporting and communications, which we of course can include partly in those other items, depending on whether uh, the issue is kind of a schedule management and follow up of the schedule or uh, quality control uh, connected to project scope and so on. And uh, what that uh, needs to be uh, uh, done effectively. So uh, when we are talking about reporting and communications, uh, I would uh, uh, now here repeat uh, a little bit uh, what we already were discussing uh, uh, in the first lecture. And uh, that uh, thing is the project manager's tasks. And when we are talking about uh, the communications and reporting, uh, we could take, for example, this project manager's task number uh, four, which is more or less connecting the project to uh, the external environment uh, by uh, taking care of communications with external stakeholders. External stakeholders can be the customer, financiers uh, and uh, authorities that are supportive for uh, the project, but also uh, some opponents uh, uh, that are very critical towards the project and, uh, and uh, that part is an important uh, part of the communication. Also, this number three, uh, protecting and safeguarding the project organization from uh, external uh, uh, disruptive uh, effects. So that is also important. Maybe that number three is connected to number four. And of course, this number one, making decisions and uh, number two, leading the project organization and managing the actual work in the core of the project. Okay, now towards schedule and resource management. And uh, in the class, uh, I uh, tend uh, to uh, give students a uh, 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 multiple choice question, like uh, for example, this one, uh, which uh, asks, uh, about what uh, the statements do you think that are true? What, uh, according to your opinion, are uh, true? The question is that which of the following statements are essential when aiming to shorten the project duration to a minimum? So when aiming to execute and complete the project as fast as possible. And then there are statements, number one, all activities should be started at the earliest possible moment, number two, and so on. Now, now uh, I don't elaborate here in this video these questions or answers to these questions. I just offer this to you if you want uh, to spend for a while and uh, uh, try to think what you would like to answer to these uh, statements, which are true, which are not. Uh, and uh, in that way, I... Uh, would just uh, like to inspire you by your own thinking, uh, active thinking about these issues to uh, receive what comes next in the videos. So, but I, I don't want to elaborate them more. These are just uh, 
questions that you would uh, could uh, uh, think about if you like and now we are going to go forward and now um, we are going to go to the golden principles for defining the project scope that is the project end product and the project work content and they are connected we must know what the end product would be to understand what work items are needed to uh, achieve uh, that end product okay uh, defining the project sc scope and work content uh, item number one in this picture so uh, to be goal directed we must set boundaries for the project scope and uh, actions to be conducted we must th this setting boundaries means also that we must limit the project scope and we must limit the work content well uh, number two the scope and work definition uh, must communicate clearly what is included in the project but also what is not included and there is certain reason that I can explain in the next slide uh, why it's important to set boundaries set limits and to also understand what uh, at the same time what is not included in the project when we define what is included okay number three project uh, end product can be defined based on the uh, performance or functionality technical specification or customers uh, or other stakeholders uh, needs and expectations and uh, the important thing in number four is that the uh, end product is the starting point uh, to understand what work is needed to make this uh, uh, end product to realize okay now this slide uh, why is it important uh, to set boundaries and objectives uh, and the title here in this picture says that th there is a phenomenon called feature creep and uh, feature creep, uh, creep or uh, it is also called gold plating uh, is a kind of a um, phenomenon where uh, uh, the project uh, organization and people in the project organization tend to uh, include some features in the end product or in the scope that uh, they think uh, are uh, nice to have or good to have or or are needed and uh, uh, that comes uh, mostly uh, uh, or that is based mostly on the ambition ambition of engineers or ambition of, of uh, people working in a project and, and and their professional pride that uh, they make too good uh, products or too high quality in a way um, because they are ambitious they, they they want to do a perfect job and if we don't set boundaries or limits uh, they make uh, let's say two good products and two costly product, uh, products also so number two here uh, item number two here says that uh, that uh, for example there is uh, this kind of approach uh, that is called design to cost uh, where we set the cost for a person uh, planning a certain end product or a part of the end product or 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 uh, what whatever that uh, responsibility for that person is and uh, and uh, we set the cost and say that for example this item uh, that you are planning to be implemented uh, should uh, not cost more than for example 100 euros and that already sets uh, uh, the quality in a way uh, of the product and and the features implicitly that can be included in the product you cannot start uh, doing any gold plating if uh, the cost is uh, limited to uh, 
such number, but th that uh, cost uh, uh, affects, uh, well, from uh, item number 2a in this picture, that affects the uh, item number C, 2c. Uh, so we could also uh, set the technical specifications of the end product and say that, okay, this is the kind of a product that you, you must make, but we can also set the cost uh, of the product and that all already in a way implicitly uh, defines uh, the scope uh, or the quality or limits the features of the end product that the uh, person is uh, planning. Okay, this applies also, of course, to time. Uh, we must uh, set objective for activity durations, that is 2b, and so on. And uh, here in 2a, uh, I have been elaborating there that, that, okay, normally we think that there is an estimate, and then we set a kind of an objective uh, that is, for example, cost objective is the budget. But uh, now we can also uh, start by setting the objective that is the kind of a cost limit, for example, and, and, and then that leads to action uh, that uh, implicitly then uh, brings a kind of a right kind of a end product that this person is making. Okay, good. Uh, well, now uh, we are going to uh, go into the uh, uh, kind of a project uh, breakdown. Uh, we are going to understand uh, how we are uh, kind of a, uh, going to subdivide the pro uh, project's product and the work content in uh, smaller items that are more manageable. And uh, in this picture uh, we are referring to project or product breakdown structure of a project and then work breakdown structure of a project. And uh, uh, we say here that the work breakdown structure VBS is a combination of the breakdowns for the project product and the project work. So work breakdown structure, it kind of a combines the product. It, it is a kind of a hierarchical uh, breakdown that combines the product and the work needed to do for the product. Uh, in this picture, uh, there is a kind of a red color notion of where we say that there are two other breakdowns, organization breakdown structure, OBS, and cost breakdown structure, CBS. But uh, the notion is that these are not project-specific breakdowns, but these are breakdowns that are connected to the firm and firm structure. So, uh, organization breakdown structure uh, defines the uh, firm and the uh, departmental uh, or uh, some kind of a, a unit uh, structure of uh, the firm uh, that bring actually the resources to the project and uh, that breakdown is common to all projects in that firm. And also the cost breakdown uh, structure is connected to the kind of a, um, uh, financial accounts uh, of the firm and also uh, that is common to all projects. So, so that doesn't necessarily, these breakdowns uh, structure the project, but it is more structuring the firm. But of course we use these breakdowns uh, uh, when we, for example, record costs or resources usage to projects, to any project. And, and that helps us to kind of uh, uh, subdivide, for example, the cost of the project that which department uh, sends these resources and, uh, and, and, and uh, uh, makes this cost for uh, the project and, and, and so on, or, or which uh, kind of a financial account or, or management accounting system account uh, uh, de defines uh, each, each cost element and so on. 
Okay, but that comes, this OBS and CBS, that comes uh, in the next lecture when we are talking about project cost management. So don't worry, but uh, just this notion that they are not pro project specific breakdowns. Okay. Well, um, work breakdown structure. Now, this is an important tool, import, important uh, starting point for finding out the work uh, items and uh, also activities uh, before starting, for example, scheduling. Uh, work breakdown structure uh, is a combination of product breakdown, that is uh, nouns, as you can see in this uh, picture. So, uh, nouns, and then there are uh, verbs uh, that we also need to define the work to be done. Uh, at the lowest part of this uh, hierarchical structure, we can have, uh, basically we could have always the same verbs, uh, plan, build, inspect, and take into use. And we can use these uh, verbs uh, with all uh, product uh, parts or product items, if you like. Um, when we have this lowest level, then item, or which is defines the kind of a work item, so we can connect time, resources, and cost to this item. It also can be that uh, we don't define uh, the physical parts of the product, but we can also uh, define uh, uh, functional parts uh, with these nouns. For example, if uh, we are planning a bicycle, for example, we could have a kind of a steering uh, system or kind of a power transmission system, so there can be also uh, functional uh, parts of, uh, of the product. Then uh, another notion there at the uh, uh, right bottom part uh, that uh, verbs can also come at the higher level of this hierarchy. So we for example can uh, uh, have an uh, information system project where uh, we have this kind of a feasibility study uh, uh, first or, or then we can have uh, programming or testing. These are kind of a verb-like verb uh, things uh, and, uh, and, and, and they can come at the upper level and then uh, the nouns can come at the lower level of this work breakdown uh, structure like uh, module A, module B, module C and so on. Okay. Um, here at the uh, right top, on, uh, top uh, part of this uh, picture, now we have this uh, uh, notion that uh, we can also have the breakdown based on geographical areas or departmental responsibility areas. Like if we do uh, um, in the project in two different geographical uh, locations, it might be wise to divide the work breakdown structure right away. Uh, into these two uh, geographical locations and then start uh, subdividing uh, the product parts and, 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 and the work items uh, based on that. Because we use this work breakdown structure also uh, as a reporting system for costs, for example, or for resource usage uh, in, the, in the project. And it is rather important to make the breakdown to fit the way the work is done. Okay. Well, uh, now uh, I have an example in the next uh, slide. Uh, and I hope that it clarifies a little bit what it means uh, when I say that uh, the subdivision is made uh, according to the way the work is done. Okay, this example is the following. Uh, if uh, we look uh, at this uh, picture uh, to the left. So let's assume that we have a new building site and we are going to build uh, there five different buildings. Office building, workshop building, uh, site laundry building, sauna building and uh, storage building. And they are different buildings in the same site, in the same land area. And uh, 
we are going to uh, buy uh, 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 foundations work for all of these buildings as one contract. And uh, in that contract, uh, we uh, have defined that we want to have the kind of a foundation planning, foundation uh, uh, casting form uh, installments, foundation concrete uh, uh, reinforcement, uh, foundation uh, concrete casting, foundation uh, foundations uh, commissioning, and uh, and uh, we could be. Uh, have connected uh, the kind of uh, installments where we pay certain parts of the projects to these, uh, let's say, uh, five different uh, phases. So, for, for, uh, for example, if we have a foundations contract for 100,000 uh, euros, uh, so we ha can have agreed that uh, when the foundations planning is being made by the contractor and we have accepted the technical plans for the foundations, then we pay 10%. Then when foundations uh, casting form uh, installments have been made uh, uh, and we have accepted as a customer, we could uh, let them charge 15% of the 100,000 and so on. And of course, in this contract, we might uh, have defined a very detailed schedules for it's building also that in which order we want to have the casting to happen and so on. But we pay then when, for example, all castings are done with all buildings and they have been happened in uh, the agreed schedule. Okay, now my question is that uh, which one uh, is a better uh, work breakdown structure, uh, let's say itemization, to have uh, these uh, all five phases and uh, installments under each building or to have this kind of a right side uh, work breakdown structure where we have uh, this foundations work as a uh, top level item and then we have these uh, mentioned uh, uh, phases and uh, installments where we pay for its, its installment uh, uh, having been uh, realized. And uh, the message is here that uh, the way the work is done. And if we must manage really the uh, contractor and we must do that uh, for the foundation's work, it might be clearer to have this uh, kind of uh, structure in the right side of this picture. Uh, where we negotiate with a contractor, uh, we uh, uh, talk with uh, the contractor, for example, with some problems. It might be that our uh, 100,000 uh, contract uh, uh, is being exceeded or ex the costs are exceeding the 100,000 and uh, we have agreed that we must pay more 115 or negotiate whether we could only need to pay 10,000 more, 110,000 and so on. So that is a kind of a item that we must focus on in our management. And it might be clearer to uh, have this right kind of a work breakdown structure where we concentrate on actual managing uh, the foundation's work. And not necessarily to split the foundation's work uh, under these buildings and have each uh, let's say, responsible person for those buildings uh, negotiating with the contractor or uh, somehow in cost reporting even uh, splitting this uh, to uh, different buildings. So it can be that uh, uh, only afterwards uh, when the project has been done, we kind of make the cost calculation uh, for buildings and, and, and then we know which building cost what and we don't need to do that continuously during the project, but in the project we concentrate on the way, way the work is done and, and very clear reporting structures and focusing on uh, the actual work and not necessarily the kind of uh, uh, after calculations of uh, product costs during the project unnecessarily. Okay, uh, maybe you got the 
I idea, at least I, I hope that this is just one example that uh, makes you hopefully think about uh, what does it mean when we say that the way the work is done. Okay, well, uh, now, uh, when we have defined the works, that is activities, then we are now starting talking about scheduling uh, those works or those activities, if you like. We start from this project uh, definition. A project is a unique entity formed of complex and interrelated activities having a predefined goal that must be completed by a specific time within budget and according to specification. So this definition is based on looking a project as an entity including activities and phases. So we have a very strong time perspective here. In the first lecture we were talking also about projects uh, but we were uh, then defining the project as a uh, temporary organization. And we were talking about business content of a project and also uh, the strategy, project strategy, strategy of a single project and so on. But here we have uh, uh, this definition where we uh, think uh, that projects are about activities and phases. And this definition says that it is complex and the activities are interrelated. This means that these activities have uh, predecessor, successor connections that uh, certain activities must be precede the, uh, some other activities uh, and, and some other activities can only follow when the predecessors are done. So this is kind of a complex system where it is not irrelevant uh, in which uh, order we uh, do those project activities. Mm -hmm. Now, um, when starting the scheduling, let's take a look of the kind of end result of calculating the activity network. And the end result, uh, let's say, simply is a schedule where we have been able to position those activities in the time axis. And we have done it in this picture. This is a Gantt chart where activities have been placed uh, in on time on, on time axis and uh, actually we don't know where the act activities should be positioned uh, beforehand uh, but when we uh, understand uh, the interrelations between the activities and we calculate the activity network we can come up to this kind of a schedule where we know the activities positions in time axis well uh, let's uh, still uh, have a few words about uh, uh, this uh, picture and also a few words about milestones. Well, milestones are typically uh, described uh, as uh, this kind of a triangles uh, uh, set on uh, one corner, uh, uh, kind of an upside down triangle. And uh, here the milestone can be, for example, the outer wall uh, uh, works started. And milestone, uh, that is an event that uh, repre represents a point of uh, uh, special significance for the project. And it is an event which is a kind of a binary. It is on or off. It has uh, uh, occurred or it has not occurred. So it is an event that doesn't consume time or resources. It just either is happened or it it, it is not happened. It, it has not happened. Okay. And uh, there can be another milestone here that, for example, the outer roofing, roofing structures have been completed and the project start has been started and, uh, and for example the project has been ended. And I think that this is uh, rather important to understand also uh, the project uh, uh, by, by looking the project uh, uh, through these uh, significant points of time how the project in a way progresses and not only these 
activities and activity statuses. And one uh, uh, way of uh, looking at the project is to uh, look the project uh, through milestones by having a kind of a milestone chart uh, and starting the planning from the end towards the beginning by uh, thinking first that when the whole project has been uh, or must have uh, be completed then what is the previous milestone uh, that is kind of a very significant uh, to enable uh, the project's uh, completion at that time then what is the previous to that and so on uh, and, and then we can kind of uh, understand the whole logic that uh, which are the kind of uh, points of time or events uh, through which the project uh, uh, progresses uh, smoothly towards uh, the kind of uh, end state that we want to have. Well, um, mm, when we have now here this um, um, gun chart show, I also want to show you this uh, broken line diagram or broken a line type of uh, uh, reporting uh, the status of the project when it is under execution. So if we have here uh, this time now, point of time uh, that is 15 days, so uh, we can have this broken line type of a drawing where we uh, can express that for example inner wall casting is ahead of time it is completed already, some 70 or 80% or is completed or already, and we are talking about percent complete. So how much uh, or, or uh, what is the percent complete of the end product of that activity? Then uh, the uh, H, we AC throughput connections are kind of a, uh, uh, late, uh, that is only 50% complete, uh, that activity and, and so on. So this is the way of reporting also uh, the progress of the project uh, when we have the project ongoing then later. Okay, uh, now uh, I already mentioned to you uh, about the kind of a milestone chart. We have it here. Now the milestones are not uh, marked with the triangles, but uh, uh, more like uh, squares that uh, are kind of uh, put uh, to uh, stand on their corner, uh, one, one of the corner or corners. And, uh, and uh, the, I already explained about the uh, idea of the milestone chart of, uh, for example, planning the project from the end towards the beginning. Okay, uh, let's uh, now uh, jump a little bit uh, towards uh, the lecture number five, where we are talking about innovation projects and development projects, internal development projects to a firm, for example. And uh, uh, we can uh, uh, look the innovation project uh, by uh, seeing that as a kind of a combination of uh, uh, phases and decision-making points. Uh, we can call that the kind of a stage gate or phase review uh, type of um, uh, description of the project's progress where uh, the project uh, is taken forward uh, through phases and then there are important decision-making points that can be called gates or reviews. Uh, and uh, the analogy here about uh, these decision-making points and milestones is uh, rather clear, but uh, the fact that they are called uh, decision-making points or gates means that uh, really uh, uh, certain uh, decision makers are collected to these decision-making points and decisions are made whether the innovation project is taken forward to the next phase that is a kind of a go decision 
or whether it is returned to the previous phase, uh, or whether uh, we are putting the development project on hold for a while because we must uh, put resources to other projects and, uh, and, and, and we want to wait for a while uh, until we continue or whether we will kill uh, this de uh, development project for good uh, because we think that it doesn't uh, develop uh, such a kind of an end result which uh, would be beneficial or profitable enough uh, or, 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 or something. So, some, some other reason uh, for not continuing uh, this project. And uh, another uh, point here is that uh, when we are talking about phases, it can be that we uh, uh, make very detailed schedule uh, uh, depending on a phase, uh, uh, whether we would like to uh, plan that in uh, kind of in a detailed way. Or, but it also can be that many times when innovation projects are rather ambiguous and we don't have an end product definition uh, at that detailed level, so it can be that we uh, can give more freedom to making these phases in between the gates uh, and, and, and these uh, gates or decision making points are the ultimate uh, uh, important uh, uh, let's say, uh, points where we direct or redirect or give permission to continue uh, uh, according to the original uh, plan for the project. Okay, now we are ready uh, to uh, uh, go into activity networks and activity network calculation and scheduling the project tasks. And, uh, First, let's take a look at uh, the notation of activity networks. So, uh, the activities at this upper picture are marked uh, with nodes, and uh, the uh, predecessor successor relationships between the activities are marked with arrows between the nodes. In the lower picture, we have the same network where the activities are marked uh, uh, with uh, arrows, and then there are these event nodes that connect uh, these arrows. We use this upper picture notation uh, in uh, our activity network calculation. Okay, now um, let's uh, look the notation. Uh, for activity network calculation a little bit further. Uh, first of all, uh, the activities are marked with nodes. The activities are uh, described like this box in this picture. Uh, the dependencies are uh, marked with uh, arrows between uh, the activity nodes. So predecessor successor uh, relationships. And uh, it is important to understand uh, that the predecessor successor relationships or de dependencies, they don't, uh, uh, they only define uh, the logic of the order uh, of the activity and not uh, necessarily or not at all uh, the position of the activity in the time axis. But after calculating the activity network, uh, we can find uh, the uh, possible, uh, uh, let's say, const constraints or possible places where we can put the activities uh, in the uh, time axis so that they don't uh, delay the whole project. Now, uh, in this activity node, we have the name of the activity and we have the duration of the activity. And, uh, in the corners of this node, we have also uh, these uh, variables that we need in the activity network calculation. The earliest start of the activity, the earliest finish of the activity, the latest start of the activity, or and the latest finish of the activity. 
And if you like, when you are calculating an activity network, you can also have uh, the float in the marked in the activity node. So you can include also this float there. And we find out uh, soon what the float means and how the float is calculated. Okay. Uh, when we are defining the activity durations, we can use the realized uh, previous projects. Uh, we can use expert estimates. But I think that uh, these two last items in this picture are rather important, or last two last points are important to understand. Uh, first, activities tend to take all the time that is allocated to them. So if we give someone 10 days time to do an activity, so normally that takes 10 days. If we give uh, the same person 20 days uh, time to make that activity, uh, it tends to take 20 days. It can be that the person starts rather late because uh, they know that uh, it doesn't take all the time and so on. So we, we can start later and so on. But still, uh, it uh, tends to take all the time that is normally allocated to the activity. Then the last one, the duration of the, an activity is dependent on available resources and the use of resources. And we come back to that after we have been looking how activity network is calculated. Okay, now we are ready to take our example project uh, and uh, start calculating the activity network here. Uh, we start first by uh, looking uh, the work breakdown structure of our wall painting example project. And uh, in this uh, work breakdown structure of our project, we have uh, subdivided the project uh, into uh, work items uh, or detailed level activities. Like, for example, if we look at the lower part of uh, this hierarchical uh, work breakdown structure, we can see that there is remove furniture, 15 minutes, clean up, spray gun and equipment, 30 minutes, bring furniture back, 15 minutes, store equipment and leftover paint, 45 minutes and so on. So. Now when we have these uh, activities and their durations, we can form the activity network. And uh, we can see that here in the uh, top right corner, there is this uh, notation where we have the earliest start, earliest finish, latest start and latest finish of the activity. And uh, the uh, dependencies between the activities, predecessor, successor dependencies are marked with arrows. Okay, first we uh, mark uh, the starting calendar time to all activities that don't have predecessors. So we have marked here zero, time point zero to uh, all three activities uh, as their earliest start times, uh, which don't have uh, uh, predecessors. Remove, remove furniture, put paint in, spray gun, and get window washing equipment. Uh, they start earliest at the point of time zero. Okay, now I have a kind of a, some explanation text coming to these pictures, but uh, I explain uh, this calculation orally, I might just uh, then uh, have this text uh, on in these pictures, but I move to the next uh, uh, slide where we continue the calculation. So I don't uh, want to let you too much to uh, start uh, spending time in reading what the explanation is, but I try to tell it to you orally and then I show the explanation and we go further to the next phase of the calculation. Okay, now we calculate the earliest finish for these starting activities. So uh, remove furniture, earliest start zero, plus duration 15, earliest finish is 15. 
Okay, that is rather simple. Okay, we do the forward pass computation for the early schedule now here, and we are going to move forward towards the end of the uh, activity network. Now we have a situation where uh, an activity, actually three of them, but an activity has two predecessors. So uh, there are three activities uh, which have two predecessors. The predecessors are remove furniture and put put paint in spray gun. Uh, we take uh, the larger uh, earliest finish of the predecessor and uh, put that as the earliest start of uh, the actual activity following the predecessors. And uh, this is uh, rather logical, uh, let's say, that uh, in order to the uh, successor uh, activity uh, been able, uh, well, I, I hope that I said co correctly, but, uh, but we put that in the earliest start activity of the successor. Okay. Uh, in order to uh, have the uh, successor activity to start uh, earliest at certain point of time, we must take the longer predecessing part, uh, path uh, to uh, enable uh, the earliest start at that point of time. So the both remove furniture and put paint in the spray gun uh, activities as predecessors must have been completed before the successor activities can start. So we take the larger of those number 15 from 15 and 5 and we take this uh, 15 to the successors earliest start. Okay, then we go on and we have calculated uh, from the beginning to the end uh, the activity network. So we have calculated the early schedule following this logic which I uh, explained. And uh, now we can see that uh, the earliest finish of the last activity is 165. So our project's duration is 165. The earliest finish is 165. Okay, now how do we uh, continue from this? Now we take this uh, earliest finish of the last activity and we also put that 165 earliest finish at uh, the same time as the earliest finish to latest finish of that, that last activity. And why? Because our project can be finished uh, earliest at 165, so why uh, make it finish later or, or in some other time? Let's. Uh, make a decision that our project's duration is 165 and then we also put this 165 to the latest finish of the last activity. And here we start uh, the backward pass cal computation of the activity network and we calculate the uh, late schedule. Okay, so last activity, latest finish 165 minus duration 45 is the latest start 120. We move this 120 to uh, the uh, latest uh, finish of the uh, predecessors and again we go towards the start of the activity network. Okay, now we face uh, a situation where we have uh, um, an activity which has two successors. Actually, we have four of them. These four activities have two successors, and the successors are clean up, spray gun and equipment, and bring furniture back. Uh, now we take the smaller uh, of uh, these uh, latest uh, start activities and uh, put this value to the uh, latest finish of the uh, predecessor activity, the four of them. Okay, uh, 
the logic is, again, it is rather clear if we start thinking about uh, what we are doing here. So, uh, because uh, both of these successors clean up spray gun and bring furniture back, uh, must uh, be able to start uh, at their uh, latest start times, either 90 minutes or 105 minutes. So the predecessors must be completed uh, in a point of time that allows both of these successors to start. So, of course, we must then take the smaller uh, of these 90 or 105 and put this 90 uh, to the predecessors' uh, latest finishes. Okay, following this logic, uh, we have now then calculated uh, 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 the kind of a backboard pass and we have calculated the late schedule. And we have here uh, then the actual complete uh, activity network. And now when we have this network, we can find out which activities are critical activities and what is the critical path of critical activities. And the critical activities and critical path is marked with red color here. Okay. Uh, what uh, defines uh, the criticality of the activity? We can see that in all critical activities, with all critical activities, the earliest start and latest start figure is the same. For example, if we look at the third critical activity in the critical path, so spray red, red uh, bedroom walls. So we can see that the earliest start is 60 minutes and the latest start is 60 minutes. So we must start the critical activity at uh, the point of time of 60 minutes and there is no float or the float is zero. We must really do the activity at that point of time, exactly at that point of time. And if the activity is delayed from uh, that point of time, then the whole project will be de delayed. And uh, the float is calculated by subtracting uh, the earliest start from latest start, or respectively subtracting uh, the earliest finish from the latest finish. So, for example, this spray bedroom walls, we subtract uh, 60 earliest start from uh, latest start 60, that is zero. Okay, let's look at those uh, activities that are not critical. Let's uh, look at the uh, lowest uh, path uh, or path that is described uh, as kind of a lowest part uh, in this, uh, this activity uh, network picture. And, and let's take uh, the second activity there uh, at the bottom of this picture. So wash windows. Uh, the earliest start of wash windows activity is five minutes. And the latest start of uh, this uh, wash windows activity is 60 minutes. So we don't need to start uh, this wash windows at five minutes. We can also start it uh, at, at the point of time of 60 minutes or somewhere, some, uh, somewhere in between these uh, two values, 5 to 60 in the time axis. And still we can maintain the schedule of 165 minutes for the total project. We have uh, a float of, for that activity that is uh, 55, that is uh, 60, the latest start minus 5, earliest start. 60 minus 5 is 55, or 90 minus 35, respectively, the latest finish minus uh, earliest finish. So that is again the 55. The float is 55 minutes. Okay. Now we can have uh, those activities in the Gantt chart because we know uh, the uh, boundaries, the limitations uh, 
of times where we can position the activities into and critical activities we must put exactly to those points of time where uh, they are now marked here. So uh, let's uh, look at the, the Gantt chart next. And in this picture we have uh, positioned uh, the activities to the Gantt chart. Uh, the critical activities are marked again with bars, bars with left, uh, red color. And uh, the activities that are non-critical, the activities with float, uh, they are uh, marked with uh, white color uh, bars. Uh, we have scheduled those non-critical activities to start at the earliest possible time, their earliest start times here in this picture. We wouldn't have needed to do so, but we have done it in that way now here. Uh, and then we have marked uh, the float as a kind of a tail or line uh, following this bar to show that uh, this float uh, is a kind of a range that uh, allows us to shift uh, uh, the bar to a later uh, point of time, to a later position that is uh, uh, defined uh, by the float. The float uh, gives the range that we can really um, position the activity into so that it, it doesn't uh, uh, affect uh, the project's uh, total dura days duration. Okay. Now let's talk about uh, resources. People are resources, people with certain capabilities, equipment, materials, money, even space is a resource. And an example of a space being a resource is that uh, if we, for example, uh, make a, a, a cruise vessel, for example, with small uh, cabins there, so when certain individual goes into the cabin, cabin, uh, cabin to, for example, install, uh, for example, uh, uh, water pipes there, uh, that resource that uh, space, that specific cabin where the installment is going to happen uh, is res uh, reserved for uh, that installment work. And because it is such a small cabin where there is no room for another uh, worker, for example, electrician, to come and start uh, making their installments. So uh, that uh, resource, the whole cabin, is reserved at that time when the uh, uh, water pipe installments are made. Okay, but we are talking about people uh, now as resources in this example. And we have here at the upper part of this picture, we have the uh, uh, same uh, uh, bar chart that uh, we had before. It looks a little bit different because we have stretched it a little bit and, and, and maybe shrinked it uh, uh, in, uh, vertically. But uh, uh, it is the same bar chart uh, with uh, 165 minutes of project duration and so on. And uh, then we have below it uh, in the same uh, time axis we have uh, the resource uh, usage. And uh, we have two types of resources that these activities consume painter and carrier, okay? And if we start these activities that are non-critical at the earliest possible time, we, of course, we know which activities consume which resources. So we have calculated that uh, we would need, at the first five minutes, we would have uh, four carriers, four people to kind of uh, to carry the stuff uh, somewhere and uh, and, and, and so on. So we have kind of a resource peak there. Uh, but we don't need to start all these activities at the very uh, beginning of the project because uh, the, uh, there is one critical activity but then the two activities have uh, float and we could uh, easily shift them to start later and that would kind of uh, uh, 
balance the resource usage <coughs> so that probably we could have a much more flat or optimal resource usage where we don't have this kind of peaks of four carriers for a while, but we could uh, maybe manage the project with only one or two uh, carriers and, uh, and, and one or two painters and also uh, kind of a have them, them to stay in our project for a longer time and not just kind of a drop in and, and uh, uh, during the peaks uh, and, and, and so on. Okay, uh, this picture actually also underlined one important thing. And uh, this important uh, thing uh, was the connection between the time and resources or co connection between uh, the kind of uh, 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 time and uh, cost. And depending on how we schedule the activities and when we are going to uh, uh, do them, then that affects when we need resources and when the costs are actually accumulated. Uh, I already showed this broken line uh, way, broken line picture of uh, describing uh, the project under execution, uh, that what is the status of the project, what is the kind of a uh, progress, what is the percent complete of each activity. And uh, if we, for example, have now started the project and uh, the time now is 30 minutes, so we can, for example, see from this broken line picture that uh, the get window washing equipment is uh, uh, completed with some 70%, maybe 75%, but it is late uh, if we have originally started uh, this activity or planned this activity to be started in the very beginning of the project. But of course there is a float that doesn't yet affect uh, the uh, whole project's duration. So we could also have planned the uh, uh, get uh, window washing e equipment to be started much later and, uh, and, 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 and uh, that would then have been a different kind of picture uh, of reporting the progress. But, but if we have start, uh, originally planned them that to start at the very beginning of the project, then we could say that this is late compared to our original plan. Okay, I think that you got the idea. Um, now, uh, Coming back to this uh, uh, time and uh, cost connection. Uh, S-curve uh, is a kind of a curve uh, that uh, is uh, the project uh, cumulative uh, cost uh, 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 distribution or, or, or the cumulative cost is, is, is uh, usually called as a S-curve because the form of uh, the curve is, uh, has, has, has the form of the letter S. Uh, and uh, if we now are thinking about the connection between the time and cost, I can show here in this next uh, picture uh, two different S curves of the same project. And, uh, if we want uh, not to bound, bind uh, uh, capital to the project too early and do those uh, rather capital uh, in intensive parts of the project uh, mm, late, later, uh, more later than, 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 than before, then we would uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, achieve the curve uh, that is described at the kind of uh, as a lower Big, uh, lower curve of this picture. So uh, uh, to schedule the activities to start late, uh, then the capital is bound uh, much later and then uh, we wouldn't need to go uh, uh, with a kind of a dotted line picture where we would uh, put too much or too early uh, money to the project for the uh, 
let's say, costly activities. But here, when we have this kind of a picture, uh, and uh, we are talking about the connection between time and cost, I would also uh, want to underline the fact uh, that project is never a kind of a just-in-time type of a uh, production, production system where we should uh, optimize the activities by starting them very late, because we have risks and uncertainties, and I think that we must have buffers. And uh, it, maybe it is not wise to start each uh, activity as early as possible, but uh, definitely is, it is not uh, wise to start all activities and uh, at the latest uh, possible start times, because then all activities practically are uh, critical uh, if, if uh, we start them at the latest possible time uh, that, that we have. Okay, now uh, this uh, picture gives you uh, activity network terms and definitions. If you like, you could uh, read uh, these definitions with uh, thought and you could uh, uh, reflect uh, what they mean and uh, also think simultaneously what we have been discussing about the activity network calculation and scheduling and uh, and uh, planning resources. Uh, maybe the only items that I want to explain now here or refer to here in this picture is uh, the number uh, seven. Uh, that uh, when uh, we uh, do the activity network ca uh, calculation, uh, so we don't uh, take into account uh, uh, the resources yet. Uh, we, we don't uh, actually um, need the activity, uh, the resources when we are calculating from the activity network the uh, critical uh, uh, activities and critical path. Not necessarily we think that uh, there are no resource constraints, but then number eight, uh, when we start uh, looking how realistic uh, the scheduled activity, the scheduled bar chart, for example, is when we have scheduled it uh, uh, based on the information that we have got from the uh, activity network calculation, then uh, we might find that not all resources are available in optimal uh, times and uh, we must start uh, shifting uh, the uh, uh, times of doing those activities uh, as the floats allow us to do uh, so that the resources would be available. And still, if uh, there are uh, severe resource, uh, resource constraints, then we might need to uh, postpone some uh, activities and then delay the whole project probably and so on. So, uh, you can think about uh, what these definitions and uh, descriptions here in this slide uh, mean. Please read them uh, later if you like. Now, uh, still a multiple choice question. When the project's uh, short execution time is central and we want to secure the fast completion, then we should put focus on activities with long duration times, activities using resources which are difficult to acquire and so on. So, in your opinion, which ones of the following statements are true? Okay, I don't elaborate uh, uh, these questions or answers to these questions uh, neither in this uh, video, but uh, if you like, you can stay for a while over these questions and think about this and reflect uh, uh, upon what we have been discussing so far. Okay, uh, what did we learn? Uh, it's important to set boundaries and objectives for the project scope. Product breakdown is important. It's a starting point for defining the work breakdown structure. Works mean activities, and activities consume time, resources, and cost. 
then we looked at the activity network calculation and that enabled us to uh, schedule the activities in a time axis in as a Gantt chart. And uh, also the, there is an important uh, importance uh, uh, on the fact that we understand the connection between time and cost. And the resource histogram and also the S-curve uh, gives us understanding about uh, that connection. We were talking also about the milestones. Uh, milestone as an event that represents a point of uh, uh, project of special, special significance. And the milestone is binary, so it either has occurred or has not occurred. We also looked uh, also to uh, the innovation and development projects and also the decision making points as a kind of a kind of analog an analogical uh, items to milestones. And uh, there we call uh, these decision making points, for example, gates or reviews where uh, uh, significant decisions about the continuation of the project is been made. Okay, um, I think that we are now done. So we have gone through these items and uh, well, I'm happy. I hope that you are happy too. Actually, I'm happy that you spent uh, time uh, with uh, me and we could have this uh, mutual time of uh, going through this lecture together. So. Thank you for participating and see you in the next lecture. Bye.